So next, I think, is the EKG session. SVTs. You must be aware of the different kinds of SVTs. AV neural reentry is the most common, where the reentry is electricity spinning around the tissues surrounding the AV node, as I will explain later. Later, AVRT, atrioventricular reentry. That means there's an accessory pathway, and the reentry um, mechanism involves an accessory pathway uh, delivering electricity either orthodromically from the atria to the ventricles, and electricity goes back up um, through the accessory pathway. Um, and antidromically is where electricity goes down the accessory pathway and up the AV node. Atrial tachycardia typically is uh, automatic. Atrial uh, focus in the, in the atrial tissue firing electricity and then it conducts down the ventricles. Atrial flutters, these are typically macro reentrant uh, mechanisms around <coughs> the uh, different structures of, the, of both the right atrium or the left atrium. Multifocal atrial tachycardia and atrial fibrillation. Okay, so. When we talk about AV neural reentry, it's really reentry in the tissues that surround the AV node. The, the AV node, what we call the compact AV node, uh, this common shaped structure uh, in the annular aspect of the right atrium, very close to the cosmic valve, and on top of the, of the coronary sinusostomy high up there. Um, the AV node connects with atrial tissues through two uh, main pathways. The fast pathway, which is right on top of the AV node, of the compact AV node, and the slow pathway, uh, which are extensions of the perineural tissue around the coronary sinus. So between the tricuspid annulus and the coronary sinus ostium, there's a connection of the right atrial tissue with the AV node. That becomes the slow pathway. In normal uh, sinus beats, so keep in mind, this is normal anatomy. We all have this. This is nothing, nothing anomalous. Um, in some patients, this constitutes the substrate for reentry. And again, I don't know how to advance the path. The, there you go. So, what happens is that the fast pathway is not just fast, it also has a longer refractory period. And the slow pathway is not only slower, it also has a shorter refractory period. We like this analogy, which is mostly for mnemonic purposes, it has nothing to do with, with biology. But a fast boat makes a longer, uh, you know, messes up the water in a much longer um, distance uh, compared to a slow boat. Just to remember that the fast pathway has a longer refractory period. So if you have a PAC that tries to invade the fast pathway shortly after it has been activated, chances are it will be refractory, and that activation will, may proceed uh, through the slow pathway. So this is normal sinus rhythm where collides, where activations collide, but then in AV neural reentry, what if, if the fast pathway is refractory, then the slow pathway conducts, hangs around there, electricity splits, and then there you go, you have a continuous self-perpetuating uh, mechanism of reentry. Uh, is it truly AV nodal? Not really. It's, it's the perinodal tissues around the compact AV node, and this allows us to be able to cure this. How do we cure this? We burn the slow pathway. That's sim as simple as that. The slow pathway is anatomically uh, in a distinct area separate from the fast pathway, so when we burn it, we take care of it. Um, how do we recognize it on the EKG? Well, as you saw in the previous slide, electricity went, was going up the slow pathway, then split. One limb of the electricity went down the ventricles and activated the ventricles, and in parallel, electricity went up to the atrium. So atria and ventricles activate at the same time. That's why the P's and the QRSs are superimposed. You either see no P's, or maybe what we call a pseudo R prime in V1. This is the retrograde P wave. Uh, and you recognize this, the uh, pseudo R wave by comparing with the baseline sinus EKG. So the sinus EKG at baseline would not have that pseudo R wave, would not have the pseudo S's in 2, 3, and ABF. Remember, if it's retrograde conduction, it'll be midline in the atrium, we'll be in the septum between the right atrium and the left atrium and it will go from low to high. So it will be a negative P wave in 2, 3, and AVF, and it will be narrow in 2, 3, and in V1, V2, V3, because it's septal, as opposed to a sinus P wave that goes first right atrium and then and the left atrium, and it's wider. The P wave is much wider than the retrograde P. We give adenosine, it stops, because we block conduction in the, in the, atrial, in the AV nodal tissue. This, is, this illustrates that the AVNRT depends on the AV node. When you, when you block conduction in the AV node with adenosine, it'll stop. 
Adenosine blocks conduction in the AV node. If the AV node is mechanistically involved with the tachycardia, it will stop the tachycardia. If it's not mechanistically involved, it will unmask it. If it's atrial flutter, which doesn't care about the AV node, you will see the flutter waves. But AV and RT will stop with adenosine, provided you give enough, and that enough adenosine makes it to the AV node. All right, let's go to the next one. So this is how we ablate it. We put catheters so that we can recognize where the contact AV node is because we can record a haze bundle signal next to it, and we just ablate below. In most patients, that's easy. <clears throat> in some patients, it gets tough because there's low pathway. In the fast path, we can be very close. So there is a 1%, 2% risk of AV block when we ablate this low pathway. So AVRT is a situation where you have an accessory pathway. So electricity will, in sinus rhythm, activate through both. But if you get, and that generates a fusion beat, which is the delta wave that has a signature on the EKG. and um, when you get a PAC, the PAC may block in the accessory pathway and go only down the AV node and then go back up the accessory pathway. That would be orthodromic reentry. Or it'll go the opposite, block in the AV node and go down the accessory pathway, in which case you will have a very wide QRS <coughs> and you will have a, a retrograde conduction through the AV node back up to the atrium. So these are the two types. Orthodromic, like I said, going down the AV node, up the accessory pathway, Antitromic going down the accessory pathway up the AV node. Key concept here. In this case, we've drawn the accessory pathway in the left side. So it's closer to the left bundle branch, right? In, in orthodromic uh, tachycardia, electricity goes down the AV node, his bundle, right bundle, and then up. If, sorry, uh, left bundle. If we block the left bundle, it will go down the right bundle and then add conduction through the septum. So the tachycardia will become slower. All right, this is an important concept. Uh, we, not all of the accessory pathways are equal, obviously. There's right side accessory pathways, left side accessory pathways are most, more common, easier to ablate, because the mitral annulus is, is, <coughs> is less mobile than the tricuspid annulus. And these are the nomenclature. Um, you don't need to know about this, but the idea is when you have pre-excitation, you have a delta wave, this is an example in sinus rhythm, you have a kind of it's a funky delta wave, and you have, it looks like a kind of a fat R wave there in, in V1. And you can see the slurring of the QRS in other leads. And when we go into, um, into SVT, next slide, please. Um, the, you will see here we can, that the, path, the, 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 the uh, delta wave goes away. In this case, this patient had a little bit of an uh, of a <coughs> right bundle branch block but the QRS becomes narrower than in sinus rhythm. That's consistent with the orthodromic. Now, we talked about the fact that depending on where the accessory pathway is, bundle branch block may affect <coughs> the, the rate of tachycardia. This is an important concept. When you have a left side accessory pathway, electricity uses as it goes down into orthodromic tachycardia, going down the his bundle, right and left bundle. If this blocks, you prolong the tachycardia cycle length. It takes longer to complete that whole circuit. So with aberrancy, with left bundle branch block aberrancy, a left-sided left -sided accessory pathway will have a slower tachycardia. When the left bundle branch block goes away, it may become faster. Now that's something that it's not intuitive, but you can see it in the CKG. Ignore the first few bits. You have a wide complex tachycardia that switches to narrow complex tachycardia without any interruption, okay? Whenever you see a wide tachycardia, wide complex tachycardia becoming narrow without any interruptions, that's SVT with aberrancy, by definition. It cannot be an uh, VT. And the interesting thing is, if you look at this carefully, the rate of the tachycardia is slower when there is left bundle branch block. So what is the diagnosis? This is orthodromic AV, AVRT using a left-sided exercise pathway. It, that, that will make you look very smart. Just looking at the EKG, you can make an anatomical diagnosis and a physiological diagnosis. All right, next slide. All right, other forms of um, like EKG changes uh, modulated by an accessory pathway. This is an irregular rhythm that has varying degrees of QRS widths. All right, you have to think atrial fibrillation with an accessory pathway 
and, and intermittent degrees of, of varying degrees of pre-excitation. That will be in your boards. There are more classic examples. Next. Um, this is um, perhaps a more classic example. Wide complex tachycardia, irregularly irregular with varying degrees of QRS width. So varying degrees of pre-excitation. This is atrial fibrillation with an accessory pathway. It will be in your boards. Atrial tachycardia, again, it's usually focal in mechanist mechanism, and it doesn't care about AV conduction, all right? So you will see P waves here, P here, here, the major sinus, and another P wave, then you see it takes a little bit of an art to discern the P waves, but you would see how there is the PR interval doesn't matter, doesn't affect the tachycardia. When the PR interval and AV conduction does not affect the tachycardia, you have to think that AV conduction is irrelevant to it, and that's most common in atrial tachycardias. Next, okay, atrial flutter, very common. Typical atrial flutter is caused by counterclockwise reentry in the uh, tricuspid annulus, as you can see here. What is typical atrial flutter? You, you will see the negative sawtooth waves in 2, 3, and AVF. And mechanistically, this is, this is what's going on. It typically happens in, in normal hearts or perhaps hypertensive hearts. A typical atrial flutter is a close cousin of paroxysmal atrial fibrillation. You see many patients that present with palpitations, age in their mid-40s, for years, nothing happens, nothing is picked up on monitor, then one day they show up on flutter. Um, when you take care of those flutters, many of those patients, about 60% over the next five years, will show up with paroxysmal atrial fibrillation. Atrial flutter occurs whenever electricity, organ whenever fibrillation organizes itself into this. Whenever one wave of electricity starts spinning around the tricuspid valve and it completes a circuit, it sets the stage for the next turn and it's like a dog chasing its own tail. It's more likely to perpetuate itself than paroxysmal atrial fibrillation. Um, this is how it looks on the EKG. You see classically uh, in 2, 3, and AVF, you'll see the negative sawtooth waves in the EKG, positive P waves in, uh, flutter waves in V1. And um, there are different variants. There are reverse typical atrial flutter where you have a clockwise uh, reentry in the same anatomical substrate. And then there are many atypical forms of atrial flutter that occur most commonly after ablation of atrial fibrillation and are typically left atrial macro reentrant circuits. The way we ablate it, I don't know if I have a movie of that. Of course, when you give adenosine, you unmask the P wave, the flutter waves. You do not treat, you do not stop the atrial flutter. Adenosine is used primarily for diagnostic purposes when you cannot see the flutter waves, typically when you have two to one EV conduction, but it's hard to discern this flutter wave from just an inverted P wave. You give adenosine and then you see it, unmask, you unmask the flutter waves. Please don't, you don't need to do this more than once. Once you have a diagnosis, you don't use adenosine for rate control. And as I described, uh, atrial flutter can occur after AFib ablation. That's unfortunately the more common scenario for us in EP. And these are typically macro reentries, usually either roof dependent in the left atrium or pay mitral also in the left atrium. Multifocal atrial tachycardia occurs in the setting of hypoxia and usually lung disease, and is defined as uh, an atrial tachycardia that does not ha has at least three different P wave morphologies and not a single dominant one. So you will see sinus, and every now and then you will see P waves that are coming from different areas. Uh, it occurs also in the context of um, digoxin toxicity. <laughs> 